All right. Uh, welcome to the SIG instrumentation of KPIs. <coughs> My name is Han Kang. I'm, I'm, I'm David Ashpole. Uh, we're software engineers at Google, and uh, we're going to be leading to uh, two topics today. Uh, one of them is the metric stability framework. And then I'm going to take you through some of the work that I'm doing with distributed tracing and Kubernetes controls. Uh, to give you guys a little bit of context, uh, David and I don't actually exclusively work on SIG instrumentation. Uh, I work, I'm mean, part of the broader GKE machinery team. And you can find me at SIGNode every week. Uh, so uh, the particular issues that we have interest in uh, tend to be shaped by our backgrounds. Uh, for me specifically, that would be APIs. So first, uh, Let's start with a brief introduction to SIG instrumentation. Uh, SIG instrumentation is a special interest group, and like all special interest groups in Kubernetes, it has a charter. And so I'm just going to give you uh, a few seconds to kind of skim over some of the main bullet points of the responsibilities for SIG instrumentation. SIG instrumentation also defines a number of things which are explicitly out of scope for uh, instrumentation, and uh, those are right there. Uh, so I have done my best to summarize the, the basic principles of SIG instrumentation here. Uh, and on the, face, on the face value of things, these things make sense, right? SIG instrumentation is this horizontal SIG, and its intent is to provide these guidelines uh, for instrumenting Kubernetes components. It's supposed to review uh, instrumentation code. At the same time, it doesn't own individual metrics. Uh, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? SIG instrumentation, people are not necessarily uh, experts in the various verticals of Kubernetes. There's quite a number of different verticals. Uh, Signo, machinery, scheduling, all of these are very complicated things. And uh, just because one is an expert at observability doesn't make an expert at any of those things. Uh, so this actually poses a bit of a problem uh, historically because the people who are writing the metrics may actually not be safe instrumentation experts. And so historically, We've seen things like this. See, that's a Frederick Brands, who's the co-chair. Uh, this is a while ago. That's a memory chart. Looks pretty bad. This one, uh, you guys can't see the comment. This, this comment makes me cry a little bit on the inside. Uh, Lavalette says, are we storing the resource version in the metric name? I don't know how familiar you guys are with metrics, but that's uh, pretty horrific. And that's the fix for that metric. And you can just see reflector XX last resource version. Uh, it's pretty, pretty gorgeous. For those reflector metrics, we had another metric uh, memory leak emerge in 112. Emission web metrics also caused a memory leak because of high card knowledge. And here you can see. Uh, we screwed up finally something that wasn't uh, cardinality issues. Instead, we messed up the bucket so that basically we could tell whether a request took over eight seconds. And sometimes we need a metric uh, as in admission latency seconds and reported the actual metric in microseconds. Obviously, not, not a good thing. So, there's been a lot of problems with metrics. Uh, a natural sort of step to fixing these things uh, was uh, this metrics overhaul cap, which was led primarily by Frederick Brands and Elena Hashman. Um, and you know, it makes sense, right? We've seen all of these terrible metrics. Uh, things are written in very confusing ways. We should fix that, right? And so out of that was born this initiative. And the, the approach was uh, two things. 
So in the first phase, uh, metrics were deprecated. So you took all of these bad metrics, these things that weren't conformant, and we deprecated them. And the way that we did that was we appended you know, parentheses deprecated to help text. And at the same time, we introduced new metrics, which were supposed to be the good ones. Uh, so the first phase went, obviously, uh, swimmingly because this is how it's compatible. But then in the second phase, when we tried to remove the metrics, it turned out uh, that wasn't actually as easy as everyone thought. Uh, mostly because it turns out that even if metrics are bad or unconformant, that uh, people aren't adjusting these things. They are learning against these things, and they're just they're using them all over the place. And you can't just take them away and break all of the, the visibility that people have into their clusters. So we came into this sort of crossroads, right? Um, we want to do this thing where we want metrics to be stable like an API. Um, at the same time, we have all these broken, kind of screwed up metrics. And, you know, there's the question, like, what do we do if there's some illegal metric, which people are using to, to generate charts or alerts off of? What if that becomes a memory leak? What do you do then? Do you keep it as an API or do you fix it? Uh, so out of that came our initiative for metric stability framework. And it wasn't like we haven't tried versioning things before in Kubernetes. It's just that metrics have some kind of unique constraints. So for example, um, I work on a node and I recently, or before the metrics stability framework existed, I added an endpoint and uh, appended the version to the end of the endpoint with the hope that that way I'm at least explicitly telling users what they're getting when they query, right? But the obvious drawback of this is that moving from alpha to beta to GA um, has a lot of churn for users. So there's clearly better things to do. Uh, other ideas that we've thought of in the past but never pursued was, well, let's just have a giant documentation page that has all of the metrics in Kubernetes um, and explicitly lists what the guarantees are about. But um, I don't think we would be able to do that very well and keep it the same. So neither of those really worked all that well. We definitely needed something better. So uh, the goal of metric stability was uh, to provide a framework so that we can express stability guarantees for metrics. At the same time, we want to do a lot of this stuff as automatically as possible. Um, and you know, maintaining a huge master list of metrics and manually updating it from release to release uh, isn't super practical. Uh, second, as a stretch goal, uh, since SIG instrumentation is like a horizontal SIG and doesn't have clear lines of ownership, it would be nice to be able to centralize some of this stuff so that basically there was something that we could say this is instrumentation related stuff. Uh, so we ended up converging on a quasi versioning strategy. Uh, so metrics can be considered to be individually versioned. Uh, and this is super helpful, right? When you have, when you are versioning metrics by the endpoint, then basically, if you want to remove a single metric, then that stable endpoint now has to be hoisted. All of the other metrics from that endpoint have to be moved to a V2. And this can be a huge pain for someone who is uh, trying to ingest metrics. And if you do this as a release, then basically it's going to be a huge pain. Uh, and our quasi versioning strategy doesn't actually give metrics a version per se, it gives stability classes uh, by means of stability metadata for the metric. So first, before we get into how we did this, uh, a lot of the way that we approach this problem was shaped by Prometheus client architecture. Now, one of the very convenient things about this is that we use Prometheus to describe all of the metrics in Kubernetes. And Prometheus metric uh, registration life cycles uh, is very consistent. So it always has these three steps. As you can see, first, you define a metric. In this case, we have a summary. Uh, we have a name. We have help. And we have quantile information. Second, we take that metric definition, pass it in to a constructor, uh, Prometheus, new summary vec would be the function call, and we instantiate that metric, and we 
we retain a reference to that metric instance. And then somewhere, we register this thing, or enroll this, to a metric registry. And that allows this metric to be published to a metrics endpoint. And we take the reference from that singleton somewhere in our instrumented code, as you can see on the bottom, and we actually uh, observe some sort of thing that we want to measure. So the fact that this, that the, the metric lifecycle always occurs with these three steps gives us an opportunity. And it basically gives us an opportunity to inject our own custom logic around the lifecycle. So the first thing we do is we hijack the metric definition. And as you can see on the left, we have the original metric definition on the right. We, we basically introduced a new uh, struct, which has stability metadata. In this case, we have stability level and a deprecated version. Obviously, these things will not do anything in and of itself, right? You can't just add a couple of fields and expect things to work. So next, you have to hijack the instantiation, right? So we wrap all of the constructors, which take in now these new extra, uh, these new uh, definitions, and instantiate a metric with that metadata. Lastly, we hijack the registry. registry. So we have uh, a wrapper struct, which embeds a Prometheus registry, and we can inject custom logic during the registration cycle. So this allows us to do a lot of interesting things, work a lot of registration magic, um, depending on the stability level of, uh, of a metric. So now that you've seen the stability levels uh, and the, the, deprecation, uh, the, the deprecation field, uh, you can see that we have two stability axes, uh, axes, uh, and uh, the stability classes are either alpha or stable. And for alpha metrics, uh, basically what we are saying is that there are no stability guarantees. This is not a stable API. Uh, for stable metrics, these things are guaranteed not to change. So now you can instrument your dashboards or alert based off of this thing. Uh, next, uh, we have the deprecation axis, uh, where basically what we can do is we can signal the future deletion of a metric. And so it looks like this. Uh, if you have a stable metric in 115, let's say you deprecate it in 116. So you toggle this bit, deprecated version, to 116. You're basically saying this thing is going to be removed. In the subsequent release, that metric will be automatically hidden from the endpoint. So let's say you are ingesting metrics at this point, uh, and at this point you've upgraded your cluster, and you realize my, my, my graph is broken. Uh, then you can actually manually re-enable that metric, and you will have a one release cycle to migrate uh, off of this deprecated metric to the new one. And then the subsequent release, that metric will be deleted. Uh, obviously, it's not enough just to have stability metadata. You have to be able to enforce it. Uh, so uh, we are doing this through a multi-phase process. First, we had the metrics migration, where all of the metrics in Kubernetes now use these custom wrappers and custom registries. Uh, second, we added static analysis to validate that each of these things did not, did not uh, break our stability guarantees. Uh, in the beta stage of, uh, of the metric stability framework, we're going to forbid the direct use of Prometheus in Kubernetes components, which basically means everything has to go through the metric stability framework. So this prevents people from making errors. Uh, for the GA release of the metric stability framework, we're basically providing uh, an escape hatch so that let's say we have a stable metric which uh, becomes manifest certain memory -ish issues over time, then uh, we have one of two choices. We can either break our stability uh, guarantees or we can delete this thing, right? Uh, alternatively, if we provide a runtime escape hatch, then we can ensure that we're not breaking our metrics API. Uh, and lastly, uh, the nice thing about the stability framework is that this has allowed us to consolidate a bunch of this code into a single repository that's actually owned by SIG instrumentation, uh, which 
has had the side effect of allowing us to sort of consolidate and centralize uh, what has otherwise been a horizontal effort. Cool. So now I get to tell you about um, the fun I've been having trying to use tracing in Kubernetes controllers. And this has been something that I've been working on for about a year now, just kind of in my free time. But I think it's really fun, and it demos really well, to be honest. So uh, just to give a super quick overview on tracing, the standard, what I call RPC model, you get a request in, there's some context attached to that request, and then as the request propagates through your system, the context is propagated along with it so that the telemetry you get back from it can all be joined back together in the end to give you a nice pretty picture, like something like this. Um, and then the cool thing about this is I can take one look at it and know immediately that the writes to backend one and backend two are sequential, um, not in parallel because of the structure of the graph. So it's a nice way to not only collect information and tie things together from different components, but also to uh, be able to visualize what's happening in our system. Um, and we call this little box here a span and the whole thing together a trace. So to start with, I'm gonna tell you guys a quick story of a bug that I had uh, about this time last year. Um, pod startup normally takes about three seconds. Uh, we had a case where it would take more than 50 seconds sometimes, and that's pretty bad. Um, so like all good engineers who had a hard problem, I uh, got an intern and gave the problem to him. And so he worked on this for uh, three or four months, and he, uh, he had some fun with it and got to apply tracing to this problem to help give us more insight. And so these are some of the initial traces that I dug up of stuff that he did. You can see here, or you can't see here, but um, the big blue box says 38,000 milliseconds, which is about 38 seconds. Um, and we were able to track this bug down and found out that it actually was an entropy bug in our operating system. So when the node first boots up, doesn't have enough entropy to generate a container ID, and so it hangs until it can. Um, it's fixed now, thankfully, but that sort of planted the seed in my mind, and I said, wait, this would be really, really cool to be able to use to trace other things in Kubernetes, because right now, um, things aren't so great. So let's take a look at what we have in Kubernetes right now and sort of where we're lacking. Um, usually my go-to ends up, when I debug production issues in GKE, ends up being logs. So you go in, you go to the kubelet logs, you grep for the name or grep for the UID or grep for the container ID, right? And it's a, a big struggle um, because the kubelet logs a lot. Um, and so this is all slow and it's no fun. Um, so logs are there, but they're kind of a last resort. Uh, metrics are awesome when you have uh, cardinality that gives you the metadata that you need. So most of the time it's not feasible to put things like a container ID in a metric because that would explode your backend. Um, and events are awesome, but they're short-lived. So for me, when, at the point when I usually get to a customer's cluster, they're all gone. Um, and once I have them, they can kind of be difficult to parse. So I, I can see, for example, that there are a bunch of events, all of which we have 10,000 of. Um, and um, so I know something's going wrong. But unless I really know what I'm doing, which most of the time I do, um, I can't figure out what's actually wrong in the system and track it down. So, uh, my favorite part about tracing, though, is just how easy it is to visualize and look at. Um, you'll see later in my demos that um, tracing is really a nice way to present information. Um, and as a Kubernetes developer, I really want this for myself. Okay, so um, I've been talking about Kubernetes as if the standard RPC model doesn't apply, but technically, there is one place where it does, and that's the API server. So user sends a request to the API server to create a config map, that then gets forwarded to etcd, it comes back, and we're all done. And so we would expect that request to look something like this here. So I figured I would give this a quick demo. So let's see. Um, here I have my cluster. It's this one up here, just an EDE cluster that I built. Um, and I can do a, whoops. Okay, so I can do a kube control 
create. I can create a config map. Whoops. Of course, I forget to do it. Um, and all I'm doing here is attaching a context to this request with my dash dash trace. So then if I pop over to Zipkin, um, I can go look for my traces. And lo and behold, there's a trace that looks exactly like what I expected it to. I sent my request to the API server, got it from etcd, and that's pretty cool, right? Uh, if you're Han over here who works on the API server, you're happy. Um, if you're everyone else, then uh, there's still some stuff missing. So let's, let's go dive back into that. Great, great. OK, so how did I do this? Um, I'm using OpenTelemetry, um, which, or technically I'm using OpenCensus, but it's now all being built into OpenTelemetry. So presumably this will all still work in, in a couple months when we migrate to it. But it's pretty simple. So um, the uh, HTTP server for the API server has added this, um, has wrapped the HTTP handler so that it's instrumented, and the gRPC client in the API server has also added a dial option that sends telemetry out. So I just had to do this, and boom, this all works, which is pretty fun. And as I said, there's more to it, right? Uh, specifically, what do I expect to get? I expect to get traces from the controller manager, from the scheduler. I want to know, I especially want to know what the kubelet and the container runtime are doing. Um, and I want to be able to visualize that and understand quickly what's going on. So there's one problem we have to solve before we can realize that dream. And uh, that's called context propagation. Um, so for HTTP, for example, in order to send a context that's in a context.context .context go object from one go binary to another, uh, what you have to do is you have to take the value out of the context, stick it in the request header, send it along with the request, and then the receiving server can take it out of the header, and then put it back in a Go, go context for me to use with my telemetry. So for Kubernetes, we want to do something that looks pretty similar to this. And uh, actually, there's something that fits the bill pretty well. Instead of using HTTP headers, which are key value stores, we can use this lovely key value store that Kubernetes gives us. So we can take the context out of the context, stick it in an annotation, um, and then the next controller that works on that object can take it out of the annotation and use that to instrument um, their traces, right? So um, as a node developer, I said, OK, let's start with a pod, right? What should it look like when we're all said and done? Um, and so I wrote down some things that I thought should be in there, like scheduling and all of the calls to the container runtime, right? The basic stuff. So let's see what that looks like. So first, I'll just show you what I'm creating. So I'm just creating the simplest pod I could come up with. Um, cube control create pod. And I'll remember it this time. Someone's this like done this demo before. This is blowingly cool. I don't know about you guys, but I think this thing is like pretty crazy. OK, let's try it again. Do, do, do. All right, so let's see what Zipkin has for us. Let's go back. What was that? Oh. OK, cool. So this looks like our trace. So let's um, take a look at this. I can see that just like when I created my config map, I have this, uh, these initial spans here that are for creating the object for the pod and the etcd transaction for that. But then I can see that I've got a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Um, I can see that the kubelet, or sorry, the scheduler is the next guy up. And we can see that the pod is scheduled. We can see that the kubelet updates the status to reflect that it's received the pod. And then we see all of the fun um, container runtime operations that are being sent to uh, Docker. So all of this we can now see connected together across multiple different Kubernetes component for the pod object. And that was, that was pretty cool, being able to get to this point, as Hans said. OK. Back to the slides. Exciting. So how did I do that? Um, 
just like in the API server, I had to add something to wrap the, or I had to add a wrapper around the HTTP client. Um, I had to add a gRPC dial option for the container runtime interface. In the scheduler, I tossed in a start span from object, which is just the helper function I defined to take the context out of the object and start a span with it. Um, and this is all I had to do, uh, was wrap what I was doing in a span. Um, and then in the kubelet, I had to do almost exactly the same thing when it decides that it's going to create the pod. Um, I had to start a span from the object, but then that context that I get back from starting the span, I can actually use in all of my calls to the container runtime to get instrumentation from those. So all of that was added, just, just required adding a couple more lines of code to get all, um, all that fun stuff. Okay, and then back to the thing I was initially trying to do, right? I wanna create a deployment. But this is slightly more complex because it spans multiple objects. It's not just, here, create this object, attach a context. Now there's sort of this weird hierarchical relationship between some objects, and I need to figure out how to deal with that. Um, so I could just say, hey, I'm a node guy. All I really care about is the kubelet. Um, just give me a bunch of pod traces, because after all, that's all a deployment really is. But uh, my friends who work on the controller manager would disagree with me. Um, so, uh, I think it's more useful to have uh, one trace per object that you create that describes all the things that happen in Kubernetes. So what we really need to be able to do is to figure out a way to propagate context from the higher level objects, like a deployment or replica set, down to things like pods. So that's what we decided to do. And of course, I'm gonna demo this. I'll try and so let's check out my deployment. Um, it's pretty simple, too. Not much going on. You can see there's five replicas in here. So I'll just do a quick keep control create on my deployment, pass in the initial trace context, and of course it already exists. Someone has done all these before. All right, so we created the deployment. Now let's go back to Zipkin, see what's in here. Okay, so this latest one, I think, is what we're looking for. Um, I like to collapse them all first. Okay, so let's walk through this tree really briefly just to see all the goodness that's inside. Um, so we have the initial write, just like before, a CD transaction, awesome. Here we can see that the deployment has added a specific trace for creating the replica set, which is not happy with me. Okay, we'll just walk through this way then. Uh, the deployment has a trace for creating the replica set, um, and then we can see that the replica set has a span for creating each of the pods, and then inside each of these, right, we can see all of the work from all of the nodes in my clusters required to create each of the pods. And this, you can start to tell where this abstraction starts to get really powerful um, and really, really useful. And I'm super hopeful that um, this can be something that is useful to others as well. Being able to see all the way from the etcd transaction that creates an object all the way down to the, the calls to the CRI that are doing pull image and, and all that fun stuff. Um, so yeah. Continuing on, what did I have to do to, to make that work? Well, it's actually not that hard. Um, I had to do pretty much the same thing as I did last time, except you can see, I, so for example, for the deployment controller, I added a span for creating the replica set, and then, um, but instead of taking that context and passing it to, say, a gRPC call to the container runtime interface, I'm taking that context and sticking it in this object that I need to create. Right, so right before I create my replica set, I just say, replica set, here's your context. And now all the things associated with that replica set are tied back to my deployment creation, which is really cool. Same thing for the replica set creating a pod, right? Same steps, start a span, and then just stick the context inside of our object. Okay, now all good engineers can take a deep breath 
we're going to generalize this a little bit, right? And try and figure out what the patterns are and how we can apply this to more than just uh, David's deployment that is really simple. Uh, so uh, what things should we wrap in a span? And this gets a little bit tricky in Kubernetes because there's lots of like background processes that are constantly reconciling. And we probably don't want to trace all of that. So the important thing that I've found is that we only want to export spans when we're doing real work. So for example, um, if I had a cube builder controller here that um, is reconciling on a my object, um, I want to make sure that I have this if updates required before I start my spans. Otherwise, I'm just going to get a span each time I sync or see irrelevant updates. So if I remove this, that would be bad, and I would get a bunch of random spans that don't make any sense. Uh, whoops, I forgot something. Um, and then which object should, I, uh, should that span be associated with? Well, actually using Cube Builder makes this kind of obvious because um, usually I get a reconcile, and that reconcile is associated with a specific object, right? So there's some object that isn't in its desired state that I need to move to its desired state. So for example, with a replica set, if I were to write a Cube Builder controller for that, I would watch for replica set changes, and then when I see one, just go make sure that it is in its desired state. And if it isn't, and I need to make changes, that's when I go start my span and do my work, right? So now to the question of like, okay, I've got my hierarchical objects, and one I need to create one in order to make another. How does that relationship work, and when should I propagate spans there? Well, it's actually almost exactly the same answer as the question before. When we're doing work that moves an object from, its, from a current state to its desired state, those are the types of things that we want to trace. And if it just so happens that that work involves creating another object, well, then that's the work that we're tracing. So um, again, with my cube builder example, when I'm doing a reconcile on some object, and in order to bring that object to its desired state, I need to, say, create another or update another, well, then that's when I should propagate my context to that child object. And I want to highlight, too, that this is a total work in progress. None of this is merged upstream. There's a kept for it that's been open for a long, long time and has had lots of lovely discussion on it. Um, but uh, uh, there's definitely room for, for lots of other people to contribute and to bring their own ideas and to help move this forward so that we can all get the, the cool experience that you got earlier when we were like, wow, we can see everything that's happening to a, a deployment. Um, but I just want to mention a couple of the fun, hard problems that still don't have complete solutions to them. One is, uh, normally in RPC systems, a trace ends when everything returns, right? It goes, spreads down the tree, and then propagates back up to return a response to your user. But um, in Kubernetes, that doesn't really exist, right? You write an object, and then it's off in the wild, and it just exists. So, uh, I've been trying to be a little bit specific with my language because I believe we should try and trace moving objects from an undesired state to the desired one. And to me, that, uh, that measures the bounds of an operation that we can sort of start to make sense of. Um, and another question that I've gotten a lot that we don't really have amazing answers to is that in normal RPC systems, right, Han and I can make a request at the same time and his can be traced completely independent of mine. He can make writes to a database. I can make writes to a database, right? It all just works. But in Kubernetes, if he updates the replica count in our deployment, and then I come in afterwards and update the image, well, the controllers are just reconciling to some desired state. And should they associate things that they're doing with what he said to do or with what I said to do, right? So at the end of the day, we can do a couple different things, maybe. We could try and do both. Like, he gets a trace and I get a trace. Um, but that seems like it might have some scaling issues or other problems. Um, the other thing we can do is say that, well, we're going to tie everything to whoever made the last update, but then he's left out in the cold um, if he would like to know what, what happened. Um, so maybe we can link the traces, um, and maybe that's enough. But there's definitely a lot more interesting stuff to be solved there. So what does this look like? So I'm working on the KEP, and um, I've seen some excitement around it recently, so I'm very optimistic at this point. Um, but 
if and when that's approved, there's a ton of work to do. Imagine if I were standing up here telling you about the merits of using metrics in Kubernetes. Like, there's so much code, as Han described earlier, that's dedicated to monitoring inside of Kubernetes. Um, and there's a ton of work that needs to be done to instrument all of the things that exist, right? There's so many controllers, and, um, and many of you in the audience probably uh, work on some of them. And so if you do, and you want tracing in your controllers or in your projects outside of Kubernetes, then uh, like that's all part of building this lovely picture that we get when you can create something and see all the effects from it. So there's definitely lots, lots of room to contribute um, and lots of things that definitely need to be done. Um, and I want to end with just a lesson that I learned um, working on a couple years on C Advisor, uh, which is that it's really hard to build good integrations with lots of storage backends. Um, you add them one day, and then they're out of date the next. And because you're just a component owner and can't, don't have the time to maintain 20 integrations, they all sort of dissolve. And it's a, a generally a bad thing. Um, but I've been super excited by OpenTelemetry um, and the projects that came before them, because they sort of offer this, this uh, promise of being able to uh, have telemetry inside Kubernetes that isn't specific to uh, any particular backend and that actually works well with all of them. So um, I think this is a great place for a great tool for us to use because um, we can stay vendor neutral inside of the Kubernetes components without needing, and but we can still support in a really solid way, I hope, um, all of these vendors. So to end, I have one last demo, which is that all of the stuff I've done, I've also been sending to Jaeger. So we can see, for example, the deployment, the same deployment trace in Jaeger, right? And um, I've also been sending everything to Stackdriver. So it's pretty cool that I can just instrument this once, change a config file, and then lo and behold, I can get the same information sent wherever I want as long as they integrate. Um, and that lets you pick your back end of choice. Did you guys see the demo yesterday at the keynote? This is like that demo only for the control plane. It's And I didn't recompile pretty, my binary in front of you. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. OK, cool. I think that's all we have. Do you, yeah. anyone have any questions? No questions? Uh, for tracing? Um, uh, let's see. We had a strategy session at the Contributor Summit, and we said that we would like to have the KEP approved and this in alpha for 118. But if anyone has worked with Kubernetes open source development, things slip all the time. So that's our goal. We could always use more contributors. So if you guys are interested in this project, uh, SIG Instrumentation would love to have your contributions. In the back? What are some of the big uh, roadblocks for the KEPs that you've used for uh, Okay, um, so KEPs uh, generally, one, so I'll talk from personal experience because I've worked on five or six of them. The bigger your KEP, it gets exponentially harder to get it merged because um, if I have a KEP and I need to get it approved by one SIG, well then I can just go to that SIG's meeting every week and bother them until uh, they answer all my questions and and we can agree on something, right? But what tends to happen in really big caps uh, is that you go to one SIG and they're like, okay, make this change and then we're good. And then you go to another SIG and they're like, no, 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 revert that change, right? So it's hard to get the SIGs to talk to each other sometimes. So this particular one um, mainly involves SIG instrumentation and um, I would say, who, who, what does client go fall under? API machinery. API machinery. And um, I'm also making changes to cube control, so probably SIG CLI, right? So there's a few, just a couple SIGs that I need to go get on board. Um, and I'm not making any API changes, which is a big, like, if you want to get things in quickly, how can you do it without making API, API changes? Um, so I expect this one shouldn't take too long compared with some of the other big stuff that's been going through recently. If anyone's interested, uh, we can probably make uh, the client go changes 
orthogonal to this thing, so it can be completely decoupled. We just need to pass context through all of the Clanko methods, and you can do this in like a backward compatible way. But if someone wanted to write a cap on that and like work on that thing, then that would make landing this thing like. It's always easier to do smaller pieces, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you guys so much. Hope you enjoyed it.